Praise the Lord. I tell you, I believe the Lord's already spoken to our heart. And yes, if we went home right now, you know, <laughs> we would have been ministered to today. And, um, and thank you. Thank you, praise team. You guys, man, Amen. you chuck up under, you chuck up under who, whoever is here. You know, you have some sickness and you have things that happen with different ones because there's so many that are involved. Uh, and but you just you just carry on. I mean, that's just I mean, you just carry on. That's all it is. And, and you've never disappointed us one single time. And I, I know you've the Lord's pleased with you also. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. It's not really important that we be satisfied by stuff. It's important that he would be satisfied by stuff. And when we honestly praise him out of a heart of purity, then how could he be anything but pleased? <laughs> you know, no matter what, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And where two or three are gathered together, Jesus said, I'm in the midst of you. So we praise the Lord for that. Now, we're in the book of James. You guys, uh, I know all of you that are here with us, except maybe our first-time guest here today, have uh, been with us through mm, quite a few messages in the, in the book of James, right? Yeah. Yeah, it took me it took me six weeks to get through chapter one. I know it did, and uh, <laughs> and I know that you guys have heard the same thing, or practically the same thing, over and over and over a lot, because uh, I've had to cap and recap and redo and lead back into so that what we were doing then would make sense with what we've what's come before, because it all links together. James is, I mean, it's not just isolated little tidbits of stuff that. You know, that you hear a little bit and then, okay, well, let's think about something different and, okay, let's hear that and then we go back to what? No, it's not like that. It all, it all moves together. Everybody say context. context. All right, so context is important when you look at the Word of God. Context is 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 everything. I mean, why, what, what was, why, why did he say this? What was before it? What was after it? What, because that'll tell us what this in the middle means. And, and so everything has a context. All the words, except for Genesis 1-1, you know, and Revelation 21. Now, you, you know, you have, everything has context. Everything has a verse before it and a verse after it. And so it's important that, that we get within that context. Well, uh, James has shared with us so far in two chapters a couple of dynamic truths about mature Christians. Number one is in chapter one, James says that mature Christians um, are patient in the midst of their problems. When you're mature in Christ, you, you go through issues in life and you don't fall out. That, that one of the evidences that you are mature is that when, when hard stuff happens in life, you don't fall apart. Yeah, yeah. And one of the evidences that you do know Christ is that, man, when the pressure gets on, you don't stop. You don't quit. You don't crumble. You don't fall away. You know? And if you do, something's wrong with what you say you believe. Because in chapter 2, the second great lesson that we've learned is that mature Christians practice what they preach. Yeah, I mean, what I say I believe is backed up by what I do. And that if your faith is not strong enough to cause you to live a different way, something's wrong with that faith. He says, salvation, saving faith, like the Apostle Paul said, for by grace are you saved through faith. Yeah, yeah. And that faith is not of yourself. It's the gift of God so that no man may boast. You know, the faith that it takes to believe, Paul says, doesn't even come out of us. It comes from God. Because we don't, we don't have the power to believe God like that. And James just kind of says amen to what Paul says by saying, yeah, and that faith, if it's strong enough to save you, it's strong enough to change your life. So when I look at myself and I look at my life and I see what I do compared to what I say, James says that's evidence and, and, and faith without a life-changing example, a life-changing practice is dead. Mm -hmm. Being alone. Mm -hmm. Worthless. Yeah, yeah. So that's how you can know where you stand. So that one day when you stand before the Lord, you will not hear, depart from me, you worker of sin, for I never knew you. 
you will hear, enter in, my good and faithful servant, to the kingdom of joys of the kingdom of God. That's what I want to hear, don't you? Yeah. I want to hear well done. Yeah, not half done or probably done. You know, I want to hear well done. Not rare, not medium rare. Not, I want to hear well done. Right, my good and faithful servant. Yeah. And James says you can, you can know this by examining your faith. Now in chapter 3, he moves now into probably the most difficult area of life of, that, that all of us face. And that is what we say. Uh, the most powerful uh, part of our life to determine uh, what we are is can we control our tongue? Mm -hmm. And evidently, the people that James was preaching to, by the way, just a reminder, this, these are very, very immature Christians. These are people who, who were saved even before the Apostle Paul began to preach to people outside of Jerusalem. I mean, these were Jewish people, the first, kind of the first ones, you know. I mean, these were a bunch of, a bunch of Jewish people that believed that Jesus was their Messiah. And, and James said, you know, this is to you, my beloved brethren, uh, to the tribes that are scattered abroad, the 12 tribes, yeah. yeah. I mean, this was written to baby, 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 infantile believers in Christ who knew nothing about uh, order or rules or, or thoughts or what Christ wanted. I mean, imagine this. These, these are people that the only thing that they've done so far is they've opened up their heart and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I believe that he rose from the dead and that he didn't, that he didn't stay dead. He got off that cross and went into a tomb and on the third day he rose again and he lives to be my Savior. That's all they had done. So he's try, James is trying to build a church with people who didn't know anything more than that. Yeah, yeah. Imagine how difficult that would be. That they didn't have any teachers, they didn't have any people that you could say, you know, go see Brian or go see Billy or go see Bev or go see, you know, go see John or whoever. Because uh, <laughs> Billy and Brian and Bev and John and everybody else didn't know anything more than they knew. So he's trying to instruct them on, on, okay, what do we need to be and how do we need to be? And so here he is, and he must have had a problem bunch of people who had problems with their mouth and problems with saying things that they shouldn't say or leading in ways and opening their mouth when it ought to be listening. You know, that's one of the things James says is a problem because... In every chapter, in every chapter so far, James has had something to say about the tongue. I mean, look at it, look at it. In chapter 1, look at verse 19. Yeah, one of them escaped. Is that Jax? Might be, I don't know. All right. Look at here. <laughs> look at here. Well, it's coming to the right place. <laughs> Look what he said in chapter 1. So then, my beloved brethren, let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It, it, there he's talking about, obviously, that these people had, uh, had a, a, a problem responding in a godly way. And the way you respond is you listen twice as much as you speak, and you don't speak when you ought to be listening because the more you talk, the more wrath it builds. Uh, the more you talk, the, the less you listen. And our problem is that we talk so much, we don't hear what God is saying. In the same chapter 1, if anyone among you thinks that he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, and this one's religion is in vain. So he says here now, if you can't hold on to your tongue. Now remember, this is like just in chapter 1. I mean, this is not even chapter 3 that's all about the tongue. This is just kind of popping up in the middle of some other teaching. And he just says... You know, the way you can tell whether you're right with God and your faith is moving in the right direction and you're growing in the Lord is that you can bridle that tongue of yours. And if you can't bridle your tongue, uh, your, your religion is dead. And religion just stands for these be orthodox beliefs. It means these, this, this system of understanding that you live uh, conveying the, the fact that you have received something that's bigger than you. 
You know, it's your orthodox belief system. Your it that is dead if you can't bridle this tongue. I mean, good night, chapter two. He says, "So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty." There's the tongue again in chapter two, and he's talking about the fact that you need to understand that you're going to be judged by what you say with your mouth. So he's really just blasting away chapter three, obviously that we're about to go into right now. It's all about the tongue. The whole chapter is about the tongue. So, so far in chapter 1, 2, and 3, the tongue has been talked about. Well, look in chapter 4. You lust and, oh, th this is so amazing because this is a church now, remember. <laughs> he says in verse 1, I don't have it up here, but, but, but he says, from, from, in verse 1 says, from where come uh, wars and fighting among you? Boy, I bet that was an interesting church, don't you? I mean, they must have had some business meetings that were really great, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, he says, look, from wh where do all the, that war and fighting, as a matter of fact, when we get to chapter 4, and we'll get there, and you'll see what all that is, and it's just, it, it's amazing uh, how current it, things can be straight out of the Word of God that were written thousands of years ago. But, but he says, he says, from where, where do these wars and fightings that come uh, from you, don't they come from the lust that war in your members? That's what verse, says, verse 1 says. Yeah, I mean, you're, you guys are sitting out there with certain things that you want. And, and, and you all want something different. Or maybe some of you want the same thing and you're trying to get it in the, in the way that people try to get things. He says, and it's causing wars in the church. It's causing fightings in the church. And, and mouths are just chomping away on each other and men running away. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet... You don't have because you don't ask. And you ask and you don't receive because you ask it amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Verse, verse 11, don't speak evil one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. I mean, this is chapter 4, talking about your tongue again. Chapter 5, which has some things about the return of the Lord. Look at what he says. Don't grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. In other words, recognize that Jesus Christ is, it, it, it could come at any moment. And you need to be careful what you say because you may be saying something that is uh, terrible, that is, that is not right when the judge steps through the gate. Remember, Christ can come at any moment. And, and so be careful what you say. I'm just, I'm just showing you, really, that this thing about our tongue it is, a, is a powerful thing. This is not a little you know, not a little concept here about the kingdom of God. This is a major thing about the kingdom of God that we wouldn't, you know, and uh, pun is totally intended, that we wouldn't get licked by our own tongue, you know, because it, e it is easy for your tongue to lick you. I mean, you can get, you can be the greatest whatever you possibly can be, and then by the things that you say, uh, your value, your witness, your life, your your uh, uh, your example, you know, your your leadership can can be uh, canceled by what happens with this little thing that comes out of your mouth, because it is so powerful, yeah. it has tremendous power. So the first thing that that I want you to understand and just see, and I've got your outline so written so that you can see the, the breakdown of chapter 3. Chapter 3 is about the tongue, obviously, and I've already mentioned it. Every bit of it is about the tongue. Uh, it is, it's broken down into, into, into three, um, into, into three classifications of, of what the tongue can do. The tongue can direct, the tongue can destroy, and the tongue can delight. Good things can happen with the tongue. And in those three common characteristics of the tongue come seven pictures that James tells us that, to tell us what the tongue is like so that we can understand it and we can see what James is saying about what we're to do with it and how valuable and what, 
we not to do with it and how it can be used in our life because this little tongue, everybody say, it's powerful. I mean, think what we can do with our tongue. I mean, we can, we can, we can pray with it. We can praise with it. We can preach with it. We can witness with it. You know, we can, we can testify with it. We can, we can brag with it. We can boast with it. We can speak evil words. You know, we can, we can hurt people. We can break up homes. We can break hearts. We can, we can chastise. I mean, just every possible imaginable thing in the world can be done with this tongue. And so this is a powerful little dude in our mouth that James said, says, uh, hey, we need to get this thing under control because you obviously are, are unaware of how, how, uh, how the Lord holds you accountable for these things. And so with that thought in mind, let's just look at the power of the tongue first to direct. He begins in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now, this is the characteristic of the tongue can direct people's lives. All right. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Evidently, the church had a bunch of people that wanted to lead other people. James says, hey, quit. Literally, the, the phrase, I was talking to Wesley about this before we started church today. I said, literally, the phrase the word picture of the phrase that is there, you know, my brethren, not, not, let not many of you become teachers, is uh, quit trying to get a, lo- a, a big number of people into a small room so they can be teachers. In other words, quit crowding the room to be a teacher. Evidently, everybody there wanted to be a teacher. Everybody wanted to say something. Everybody wanted to lead something. I mean... It's kind of like the Apostle Paul in the church at Corinth. Have you read 1 Corinthians? If you read 1 Corinthians, almost everything the church was doing is wrong. They can't even take the Lord's Supper in the right way. You know, really, they're, they're, just, they're just a baby bunch of Christians who really don't know anything about the Lord. They don't have any maturity in the Lord. And yet, they're all wanting to speak. You know, in, in the famous verses about, about gifts of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul said, man, when we get in church, everybody wants to stand up and start speaking about something and saying something, and God did this and God did that. And he, he said, you just need to sit down and be quiet. And James is saying, here, look, guys, you need to stop lining up to try to be a teacher because there may be something you don't know that you need to know. And then he says in that second little part of the verse, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. In other words, look, you guys need to be aware of this, that if you're a teacher, God's going to hold you to a higher standard. That being a teacher is not only an honor, it's a responsibility. And to be a teacher means that God's going to hold you responsible in a stricter judgment than he holds people that aren't trying to teach. Why, what, what, what would be different about being a teacher than being just someone who sits to listen and be instructed? Well, when you are a teacher, you're powerful because what you teach affects people's lives. What you say sends people in directions of their life. Because you become more powerful, the power of influence that you have over people's lives, the power to change them by what you say to them or what you don't say to them or what you teach them in life. And so James says, listen, you guys need to be aware. Instead of trying to be a teacher, you, most of you need to be sitting there listening because you don't know anything. So, so. Sit down, let the Spirit of God teach you and speak through you. And, and, and unless this tongue can be controlled by the Spirit of God, unless this tongue can be led by Christ, in, in case, unless this tongue is called by the Holy Spirit to speak and lead, and it, and it leads from a mature uh, God point of view, you don't need to be talking in the church. Because God's going to hold you accountable for what you say and the things that you lead. And so I'm sure everybody started resigning. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine that's being said? And you're sitting there and you're saying, man, I'm a teacher. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. <laughs> mm. Let me turn in my resignation. By the way, we're not taking any, res- uh, we're not taking any resignations today. Yeah. So James kills everybody there by that first little statement. And so coming to verse 2, 
He recognizes this. He must have been watching their face or something, you know, and he's seeing everybody go, what? You know, and he's reading the, he's reading the room, you know. He's feeling them. And just like preachers do, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but that's what I do with you. I feel you. Um, you know, honestly, I, it's just I don't know what it is. The Holy Spirit does that, I'm sure. Uh, and based on what I say and what I do, a lot of times it's controlled by what I'm sensing and where I'm going. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's what we ask. That's what preachers pray for. When I say the Holy Spirit lead us, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Lord, let me, don't, just let me get up there and ramble about stuff that, that is not saying anything to anybody. So James must have been reading everybody, and he realized that what he just said killed everybody. It was really powerful and really strong. Don't be a teacher because God's going to hold you to a higher standard. Everybody said, oh, my God, let me resign, resign, resign. And so in verse 2, he kind of jumps back off of that. Uh, you know, kind of like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute now. Don't get all, don't get too scared about this. Uh, for we all stumble in many ways. James says, hey, hey, okay. Recognize nobody's perfect. Recognize we all have messed up. He said, I'm not talking about you have to be perfect to be a teacher because we all stumble in, in lots of ways. You can look at your friends and say amen about that, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. There's no, is there anybody here that's perfect? No. Uh, Okay, well, if you are, come to the altar because you got the spirit of lying. So we, we need to, the spirit of deception is on you. You know, we need to pray and ask the Lord to reveal some stuff to you. Yeah, because none of us are perfect, and we realize this, and we realize that this side of heaven we're not going to be perfect, right? Yeah. I mean, do we realize this? I mean, there are, there are denominations and there are belief systems that teach that once you receive Christ, you become perfect. And that you, you are perfect, you know. But James would say, here's what James would say. Okay, if you're perfect, prove it. Live that way. See, that's the, that's the deal. The deal is I can say stuff with my mouth. But James says that's not, that's not worthy. It, 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 something that's strong enough to save you is strong enough to change you. And, you're gonna, you, and we're going to know it because of what you do. And how you live your life. And so James says, hey, nobody's perfect. We all know that. One of these days we'll be made perfect when Christ comes and we, and we go with Christ. But until that time, we're not going to be perfect on this earth. But it doesn't mean that we're not striving to be perfect. Right, See, I know I'm not perfect. I guarantee you, I know I'm not perfect. And if you watch my life at every moment during the week, uh, you might even be disappointed in something that you see there. I, I, I hope not, but you might be, because I'm not perfect. All right, amen. One of these days, I, I will be when Jesus... Kyle, you don't have to be so enthusiastic. Um, but I will be. I will be. But I, I, even though I'm not perfect, I'm trying to be. I mean, I want to be. Not that I think I'm going to go to heaven by being perfect, but, but because, I, I mean, I don't, I don't live to, to be I, I live out of what I am, you know. I'm not trying to do in order to be something. I'm doing because of what I am. And the spirit that drives me causes me to live a certain way, not to try to get to heaven, but because heaven is living on the inside of me. So James says, hey, hey, okay, 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 okay. I, I killed you with that first one. Let me jump back. Uh, hey, wait, we, hey, get over it now. We all stumble, okay? Okay, I'm not saying you have to be perfect to be a teacher because all of you will quit and nobody can be per perfect. And so he says, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Uh, James says, uh, he's teaching by exaggeration. Have any of you ever done that in your own life? You just, you exaggerate something in order to make a point. Well, that's what James is doing. James is saying, okay, if, if anybody could be perfect. Now, uh, everybody say, no one can. Okay, so he's exaggerating. He's saying, let's say we could find the perfect man. If we found the perfect person who was perfect, they would never say anything that would be wrong. And if they could do that, that would prove that they're perfect because if you can control this, you can control anything else in the Christian life because this is the most difficult thing to control in all of the world. If you could, if you could get a hold of this and not sin with this, then all the rest of the Christian life would become easy because this right here is a monster that is uncontrollable. So, 
you know, we can't find the perfect one, but anyway, that's just a, you know, power of exaggeration, and we're going to, you know, uh, be, uh, uh, we're going to say if, if we could, we'll, we'll do that. All right. Now, uh, he has a couple of illustrations to show you exactly what he's talking about, and I'm going to just mention them, and, uh, and then I'll give you a little application of what I think he's saying by this, um, because this really does have an application to us, okay? This is not just, this is not just words that are trying to picture something for us. I mean, he's, they have a, do, a, do have an application. Now, remember, we're talking about this tongue has the power to direct your life. What I say as your teacher, as your leader, as your pastor, has the power of influence and the power to send you you in a direction uh, because of what I say and my words. They're, they're powerful because uh, what I say matters. What I say means something because of the honor of being your leader. And you ask me what to do. You ask me, uh, how do I think about this? What do I do, pastor? You share with me how I can change. Or, I mean, you ask all kinds of things. And then by what I say, you start changing your life. So the course of your life is affected. I am directing you by what I say. So James says, all right, let me give you a couple of pictures of what that means. The first picture is the, the picture of a bit and a horse. And it's in verse 3, and, he, and what it's about is the tongue has the power to, to, to determine great force. All right, I know that probably means nothing to you, and I can see you're underwhelmed by even my saying that. But uh, <laughs> what I'm talking about is that what James is going to picture is something that is very powerful, something that is muscular, strong, virile, powerful, it, it, it has a force to be reckoned with. And, and, and so James is going to say, uh, God has given us the power to direct something that is very powerful, that is very forceful in life. And notice the verse, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body, is what it says, we turn their whole, we can, we can, we can move the, the animal in one direction or another simply by what we do. Notice what I, I said in your notes. You look, look down. Notice how disproportionately small the tongue is in relation to the animal it directs. The average bit weighs about 24 ounces. Everybody say less than two pounds. All right, 16 ounces is a pound. So an average bit weighs 24 ounces. Imagine this now. And the largest draft breed horse uh, weighs a ton. So James is saying, uh, look at how small something is that can turn a two-ton animal from the direction that it's heading by something that is associated in, 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 the, in the nearness to the tongue, and that horse will go whatever direction you can, you can, you can put that horse, you can place that horse in whatever direction you want to by moving that bit one direction or another or pulling back on that bit, you can, you can send that tremendous force, two tons of force can be changed to a different direction by a very small little thing that is almost unnoticeable in comparison to the size of that which it determines. So he says, look, picture the tongue like a like a bit in a horse's mouth, all right? And then he comes with the second picture. It's a ship and a rudder. And, and, and it says the tongue can, can be used to change direction. So not only can the ch tongue change uh, force, can move force somewhere, it can also change direction of things. Look at what it says. Look, at, look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. In your notes, I put down, and I, I really looked at this. Guys, this is amazing. I looked at the size of some of these ships and things. Like the Queen Mary, which I think the Queen Mary is probably in mothballs by now. I mean, I think it's not even in active service anymore. It was like a big pleasure ship. You know, it's kind of like one of the predecessors of these princess cruises and all these other big cruising ships. Queen Mary at one time was the biggest ship, you know, biggest pleasure boat, pleasure ship. On the deck, it, it, it's measured, now the, the deck is measured by acres. 
Not, and, and, the, and the Queen Mary would be miniature compared to an aircraft carrier. A modern aircraft carrier has decks where the planes fly off and land that are just acres, much less the quarters and the blah, 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 blah. And the rudder of a ship that moves a certain speed, the faster the ship, the smaller the rudder. So uh, most ships that are considered uh, fast, which doesn't have to be fast like 50 miles an hour, stuff like that, it's just fast on the water. The, their little rudder is 1 60th the size of the ship, the size of the hull. So if it, when it gets pulled up out of the water, if you just look at the rudder in comparison to the size of the ship, the rudder, the rudder would be almost minuscule. I mean, it would be just a tiny little thing. So James says, um, uh, notice how a little bitty something that's attached on the back of a boat can take that boat in whatever direction um, the, the captain of that boat wants it to go. All right, now, hang on. Let, let's apply this. What is this saying? I mean, everybody understands the picture, right? I mean, it's not complicated to understand the picture of saying uh, the tongue is tiny, disproportionate to what its power is. Don't be deceived by this little tiny thing. It has great power. It has the power to direct lives, just like a bit in a horse's mouth, just like a rudder on a ship. Uh, the application then becomes both the bit and the rudder uh, have to overcome uh, contrary forces. In other words, the bit has to overcome the will and the passion of a, of a, of a wild animal that wants to go in its own direction, that is, that is powerfully moving in whatever way it wants to go. Not in a productive way, not in a predictable way, but in the way it wants to go. So, so the bit then becomes a controller of something that is contrary to good. And the rudder has to control a contrary force of, well, of winds that are blowing against the ship, that are pushing the ship you know, something from the outside, some contrary force. I mean, the, the bit is, is controlling something contrary that's coming from the inside, coming from the evil, coming from direction, coming from a, a, a willful heart and mind. But, but the rudder is coming against contrary forces that are coming from the outside, like the fierce winds that blow against the side of the ship are, are contrary currents that are under the water that you can't even see, but those currents are carrying uh, the ship in, in, a, in a contrary direction. So what is, what, is James, what is James saying? James is saying that, that, that our tongue must control the contrary forces in our lives. Look at your neighbor and say, you are contrary. Yeah, you are contrary. We all are contrary. You know why we're contrary? Because we have an old nature. Because we have a sin nature on the inside of us. Listen now, I mean, try, I hope you get this. The, the bit and the, and the rudder control contrary forces, and the bit is controlling the, the contrary force of an internal drive by a wild animal to go in its own direction. Just like inside of us, there is a will that wants to go its own direction. There is an evil inside of us that would take us away from God. There is an old sin nature that wants to move away from contrary, wild, free, out of control, run anywhere it wants to go, nature inside of us that our tongue can direct in a positive way. So just like a bit in a horse's mouth, our tongue needs to be controlled by a higher power so that that tiny little thing can control that wild nature in our life that is coming from the inside of us. 
I wish when we got saved, God took that old nature out of us. I wish he would. Then I wouldn't want to sin. Then I wouldn't sin. But according to what the scripture teaches us, God does not eradicate the old nature. God just places a new nature inside of us. Then then there becomes a battle between the old nature and the new nature. And all of our life, we have to surrender to the new nature. We have to walk. We have to feed the new nature. There's a new nature and an old nature battling on the inside of us. And you say, which one wins? Whichever one you feed the most. Yeah. So, so uh, the tongue then is a bit in, in the mouth of your spirit. Your soul, if you will, the, the seat of intellect, the seat of decision, the seat of making decisions. You are listening to me with your soul right now. You're hearing with your soul. You're making decisions with your soul. Everybody say this, I am a spirit. I have a soul and I live in a body. Okay, so you're being led. Your, your thoughts, your, your understanding, your, your surrender, your nature is your soul. And James says, we got to put a bit in, in soul's mouth because soul is a wild stallion wanting to run in its own direction. And so, and so let's put it in there and realize that God gives us words. God gives us a tongue to help control the wild, evil passions that are on the inside of us, contrary to the direction God God would have us to go. And then he says, and, and the ship, the ship has a rudder because the ship floats in an environment that the outside environment that is in seeks to push it into a direction. Just, just like, and I know some of you are ahead of me, <laughs> uh, just like we live in an environment that pushes us contrary to the things of God. We live in an environment where the winds of our environment blow us towards sin. Where the currents of our environment encourage us to go off course and do our own thing. And so James says, what God has done is a wonderful thing. God has put in our mouth a little tiny instrument, so small you might not even notice it in proportion to the dynamically large thing that it will do in your life. And, and, and this little tiny thing has the power to direct us just like a bit in a horse's mouth and a rudder on a boat to overcome the contrary forces of evil in our life. And so this is a mighty powerful weapon for good. For our tongue is a powerful director for good in God. But it has to be under the strong hand of Jesus, right? Our tongue has to be under the direction of something much greater than us in order for our tongue to be good and godly. So that's what James is encouraged here. When Jesus is Lord of your lips, he's Lord of your life. If he's not Lord of your lips, if he can't control your lips, then there's a real question as to whether the real Jesus lives in your life. Do not underestimate the power of your tongue. Solomon says to us in Proverbs, uh, uh, for the power of life and death is in the tongue. Yeah, the power of life and death. The judge says guilty or not guilty. And it affects the prisoner's entire future life. And not only his life, but his family's life and the people that love him and the people that care about him are affected by one word, guilty, or two words, not guilty. The power of life and death are in the tongue. A parent says, yes, you can do that, or no, you can't go there. And it directs a child's whole life. It, it puts them in a different direction. A powerful, powerful thing with one word or two words. Jesus spoke to a woman at the well about very, uh, very few words. He said, uh, if you'll believe me, I'll give you water and you'll never thirst again. I mean, <laughs> one sentence. And she says, Lord, give me that water. And her whole life changed by the power of life and death being in the tongue. 
The apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost when everybody was criticizing Jesus and saying, these guys are drunk and they're babbling out there. And Peter stood up and started preaching and 3,000 people came to Jesus. The power of the word, the power of the tongue to direct our lives. So tiny, almost unnoticeable. But it's a weapon of God. It's a, it's a tool of God. Just like a bit is a tool in the hands of an expert horseman. The bit can take the horse wherever the, the horseman wants him to go. The horseman has complete power to direct. When there's a bit in the mouth of the powerful animal. Just like Jesus is our expert horseman. Jesus is the, is, the, is the controller of our life because he has a bit on our tongue and he moves us where he will. The expert, the expert captain has complete control of the direction of the ship by this tiny little rudder so that even though winds and and, uh, and currents would take the ship away from the direction and put the crew's life in danger and the ship's life in danger. An expert captain can move it away from that and send it in the right direction. And what James is saying is, Jesus Christ is the captain of our life. And all of that is controlled and reflected by what we say with our tongue. And so the tongue has power to direct our life. Mm, yeah. What direction are you headed? Who's directing your tongue? Is Jesus Christ in control of your tongue? Does he have control of your life? How do you talk? What do you say? The power of life and death is in you. It's in your tongue to direct, to move, to go contrary to forces in your life to witness, to testify, to, to build up, to strengthen, to honor, to glorify God, to testify, to witness powerfully for God. It also has the power to be negative and destroy and criticize and ridicule and speak with sarcasm and to destroy somebody's heart and destroy their life and break their spirit. All in the power of the tongue, power to direct. All right. Thank you.